Good morning again. Those of you who are in the room, it's like, this is the third time this dude's told me good morning today. <laughs> Again, for those of you watching online, my name is Scott. And I'm Kirsten. We have the honor of pastoring here at Keys Church and so glad that you're with us today. Those of you who are in the room, those of you who are maybe joining us later online as we continue on in our series that we've been calling Church Words. And we kicked off this series uh, two weeks ago because this right. is week three. And the idea of the series is actually just really simple, very practical, is that we're looking at words that we use within the context of church that we hear that maybe we really don't know what they mean. And we just kind of go along with it. But we're not sure the context. We're not sure how it applies to our life. And so we're just looking at what Scripture has to say about these words, mm -hmm. then how they apply to our lives. And so in week one of the series, we talked about sin. Last week, we talked about the word repent. If you missed either one of those messages, I would encourage you. You can watch online at keyschurch.com slash watch or just search at keyschurchfl on YouTube. And so would encourage you to go and to catch up. But we're going to continue on today. And we want to teach you a message this morning that we're calling the paradox of discipleship. And as always, as we start, I, I want to encourage you to take notes. Let's not just be hearers of God's word, but let's be doers of God's word. Amen, somebody? Amen. And you can always, if it's easiest for you, just take pictures of the screen up here. It's what it's here for, is for you to take notes, take pictures. But I'm sure by the title of our message today, you probably understand the church word that we're going to be talking about. And we are going to be talking about discipleship mm -hmm. today. And it's one of those words that I, I joked around about this, about the word repent last week. And I said, repent is a show enough church word, right? And I used my southern accent, my southern slang to say that. But discipleship is much the same. You really don't hear the word discipleship outside of the context of church. And so I just real quick to start off, I want to look at how the dictionary defines discipleship. And this is what it says. It says the condition or situation of being a disciple a follower or student of some philosophy, especially a follower of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I made the joke in the first two weeks when we talked about the definition of sin and the definition of repent, and I just kind of poked fun. I was like, I, like, I don't like those definitions because they don't necessarily line up with the biblical definition of those words. I like this. <laughs> like, this lines up pretty well with the biblical definition of discipleship. And I love that it says it's the condition of, or situation. In other words, discipleship is not passive, it's active. Mm -hmm. It's something that you're actively doing. You have to actively participate in discipleship. And I, and I really love the very end that says, especially a follower of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's where the word comes from. And as much as we're going to be talking about discipleship today, mm -hmm. we're also going to be talking about a word that's in this definition that goes hand in hand with discipleship and it's simply the word disciple. I'm going to move this TV a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I was like, I can't really she see, can't it. see it. It's okay. Um, right. And so if the word discipleship is the condition or situation of being a follower or a student, then a disciple is a follower or a student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. Mm -hmm. And so the word disciple is actually used all throughout the New Testament for Jesus' followers, whether it's referencing those specific 12 disciples or whether a larger group of Jesus' disciples or his followers. And we're going to talk more today about what a disciple is and what a disciple looks like. But as we continue to talk about discipleship, um, I want us to know what it really boils down to is this, is that discipleship is the process of following Jesus. Yeah, I mean, this is the simple definition, right? If you just want like the super simple layman's term, like what does discipleship look like? It really is this simple that discipleship is the process of following Jesus. And if this is the simple definition of discipleship, then this is the simple definition of what it looks like to be a disciple, that disciples are active followers of Jesus. Right. And notice that I have active followers of Jesus. Because we live in a day and age in which cultural Christianity is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Where lots of people say that they're Christians, but not lots of people follow Jesus. And I would tell you this morning that you're not a Christian if you're not a follower of Jesus. You're not a Christian if you're not actively participating in discipleship. And I think of it this way. It's kind of a silly example, but... If you had a friend who told you they were a vegetarian, but the only time they didn't eat meat was on a Sunday, you would be like, 
I'm not sure you know what a vegetarian is. You know, like, if they're like, oh, no, man, I'm a vegetarian because I eat oatmeal every morning and there's no meat in oatmeal, so, like, therefore, I'm a vegetarian. It's like, that's not how being a vegetarian works, right? And yet, we live in a day and age in which people say, man, I'm, I'm a Christian. Well, do you follow Jesus? Eh. Like, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Are you practicing discipleship? What's that? I mean, I, I'm a Christian. Are, okay, well, are you, are you actually a disciple of Jesus? I don't even know what being a disciple of Jesus would look like. Right? And I understand that for some people, like, it's just ignorance. Maybe you're new to the faith. I don't mean ignorance is like, I don't mean that to sound harsh. Like, you just simply don't know. But for a lot of people, it's just simply that we choose not to actively follow Jesus, and yet we still want to call ourselves Christ followers. Mm -hmm. And yet we still want to call ourselves Christians. We still want to call ourselves disciples. And here's what we need to know this morning. That as Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, being a disciple and discipleship are requirements. Mm -hmm. Because in the Bible, not everyone who listened to Jesus or who showed interest in Jesus and his teachings was called a disciple. Mm -hmm. Some of these people had heard Jesus. Maybe some of them had even experienced or seen him heal um, people around them. But for most of these individuals, their interest in Jesus did not exceed or meet the commitment of what being a disciple of Jesus would have required. And so while maybe some of these people were intrigued, um, maybe they had been healed, maybe they had been fed, um, their level of interest typically only lasted about as long as their encounter with Jesus yeah. did. And so once their immediate circumstances changed, their priority and focus shifted as well. And yeah. so here's the question that I want us to ask today. What does being a disciple look like? Because here's the thing. I think if we can answer this question, what does being a disciple look like? Then we can answer the question of what is discipleship and how does discipleship apply to our lives? And so to answer this question today, we're going to look in Scripture, what we do every single week here at Keys Church because we're a Bible-believing church. And today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. And what you need to know about the Gospel of Luke is that it's just written by a guy named Luke. Who It's important to know about Luke that Luke was a doctor. This is his account of the life of Jesus. And he kind of treated this as an investigative journalist of sorts. Luke went around interviewing people who knew Jesus, who did life with Jesus. And so everything that Luke writes down for us is like firsthand information that he got from somebody who was there. And so we find this very, very reliable. And so Luke writes down for us in Luke chapter 14 an encounter that Jesus has with some people who are following him in which Jesus lays out in very plain terms, cut and dry, black and white, what being a disciple looks like. Jesus seemingly draws a line in the sand and says, if you want to follow me, if you want to call yourself a disciple, this is what it's going to cost you. And this is what Jesus says. This is Starting in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and there's all these people who are following him, or so they thought, because they wanted to be close to Jesus. Because Jesus was this famous rabbi that was going around preaching and healing people and casting out demons, and so they wanted to be a part. They wanted to follow. They wanted to be a disciple too. And this is what Jesus says to them. He turns to them and he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. We read that and we're like, ouch. Like I thought just pastors stepped on toes. Like I didn't know it was actually Jesus. You know, like I got to hate my family. Like, I have to hate myself. And here's the thing. Jesus is using some hyperbolic language here. Mm -hmm. But it's for a purpose. He's drawing a line in the sand. He's saying, if you want to follow me, it's not as simple as just following me down this road to Jerusalem. If you want to be my disciple, it's not as simple as being like, well, I hang around him and I hear his teachings. You know, that's not where it ends. Jesus continues on and he says this. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And what you need to know is that at this point, 
Jesus is the only person who knows he's going to go to the cross. Mm -hmm. Nobody else knows. Jesus knows. But it was not lost on the people who heard this what the Roman cross represented. It represented death. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, hey, you have to die to yourself. And then you need to follow me or else you can't be my disciple. And here's what we need to know, because I know that this sounds harsh and this sounds like, man, okay, you said he's using some, some hyperbolic language. So what is Jesus really saying in this passage? And he's saying this, being a disciple means making Jesus the priority. Yeah, I mean, when Jesus called his disciples, he initially called them to follow him mm -hmm. and to learn from him and to spend time with him. And if we want Jesus to be the priority in our lives, then we need to be with him. Yeah. Um, if I said to you, hey, I want to make a specific relationship in my life a priority, and you said, okay, great, Kirsten. Um, so about how much time are you spending on or with that person, like on that relationship or with that person? And I said, maybe like three hours a month, I think that you'd probably be like, oh, that doesn't sound great. Um, like, hey, maybe, you know, honestly, it doesn't really sound like it's much of a priority to you. Yeah. And I know that that seems super simplistic, um, but it is. Yeah. It honestly is. Us yeah. spending time with Jesus and making Jesus that priority more than the priority to scroll on my phone, which I am mm -hmm. so guilty of. Um, yeah. I just want to decompress and I scroll on my phone and I scroll on social media. Maybe it's your bank account. Hey, I want to, I got to hustle more. I got to make more money because it's never comfortable enough. It's yeah. never enough. Or maybe, hey, I, you know, when I come home, I want to decompress. And so I'm going to spend several hours watching TV. And yeah. if we want to be able to make Jesus the priority and our life, we're going to have to put away and put down some things because making Jesus the priority is a requirement if we want to be a disciple. Yeah. And we have to make him the priority. Notice mm -hmm. I, I didn't say a priority, <laughs> right? He has to be the priority. He has to be first. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus is saying here. And he gives this example to the people who are following him. And he says this, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. And let's say for our terms, let's say building. I don't think many people here are trying to build towers, right? So let's just say building. But he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Like, aren't you first going to budget? Aren't you going to check your bank account? Aren't you going to count the cost? You're not just going to like go and start building the tower and hope that you have enough resources to make it happen. Nobody does that. That's not wisdom. And Jesus says, no, you... You don't do that. He says, for if you lay the foundation, but you're not able to finish, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Some translations literally use the word mock, make fun of, look at you as somebody who doesn't make good decisions, who doesn't practice wisdom, because they'll say this person began to build, but they weren't able to finish. Jesus is saying you wouldn't build a tower. We wouldn't build a building. You wouldn't start a remodel on your home. You wouldn't build a house and not first know that you have the finances to actually do what it is that you started to do. That's not wisdom. Jesus is saying you have to count the cost. And he continues on. He gives another example. He says, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. So there's about to be this war. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? The other army is bigger. The other army has more resources. I'm just not going to go into the fight without counting the cost or else all of my men are going to die. Or else I'm going to lose my kingdom. We won't just lose the battle. We'll end up losing the war. He says, if he is not able, he will send a delegation while they're still a long way off and he will ask for terms of peace. He's just simply talking about using wisdom. And in these Two examples, what Jesus is saying is, hey, when it comes to being a disciple, you need to count the cost. Because this is what he says. In the same way, and what I just told you, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Mm -hmm. And that word everything in the Greek is actually the word pas, P-A-S, and it means all. And this is not hyperbolic language. Jesus is being very serious. Mm -hmm. If you don't give up all that you have, if you're not willing to give up absolutely everything, you cannot come and follow me. Mm -hmm. You cannot be my disciple. 
you think that you just want to come around and be around me because I'm a good teacher and I'm a miracle worker and I'm casting out demons. No, 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 no. If you're going to come and follow me, it's going to cost you and you need to count the cost. Right. And in scripture, we see Jesus implicitly saying to count the cost. And for some people, the cost of being a disciple and being in discipleship was too costly um, because discipleship is costly. It's not passive. It's an active thing that we do. And I promise that there is good news, though. Even though discipleship is extremely costly, we also believe that discipleship is a paradox. And it's a paradox, yes, because discipleship will cost you everything, but Mm -hmm. we believe that discipleship in Jesus Christ is priceless. It is a priceless gift that we're given. And here's what we mean by that. First, um, what paradox is. Um, And so a paradox um, is this specifically, a self-contradictory statement that when investigated proves to be well-founded or true. And when Pastor Scott and I were (laughs) writing this message together, he said, hey, so we're going to give the definition for paradox. And I immediately said, oh, yeah, it's two docks in the water. You just pull your boat up to whichever one you want. And um, and so there's with the, your... With the dad joke. I know. There's your southern mama joke for the day. Mama, M-A-W, M-A-W. Yeah. Um, so they have, like, bouffant hair, like, white bouffant hair. And they make, like, the best biscuits and gravy you've ever met, like, it's you've true. had. It's a mama. And so it's our grandmas. So there's your southern mama joke of the day. My mom's looking at me because she's real close to being a mama. <laughs> Um, no, no, so, no, no. She's a young grandma. Don't yeah, say that. she's fine. She could cut your microphone off right now. I'm just saying. <laughs> you could watch out. But a paradox, again, it's a self-contradictory statement that when investigated proves to be Mm -hmm. well-founded or true, meaning it's something that contradicts itself, something that comes in opposition with itself. But when you look into it further, it is true. And so what discipleship then being a paradox means is that following Jesus will indeed cost you everything. But we do truly believe that discipleship is a priceless gift that you have been given. Discipleship is costly and following Jesus, it will cost you everything. Yeah. And I know there's some of you who are probably like, that doesn't sound like good news. (laughs) Like you said, there was you said that there was good news. Yeah. But here's the thing. This this actually is good news. And we're going to get to that. We're going to kind of explain this and unpack this. But you may be wondering, like, when we say everything, like, what do you mean by everything? Here's what we mean by everything. This is the everything that following Jesus is going to cost you. It's going to cost you your pride. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you your comfort. It's going to cost you your position or your status. It's going to cost you your reputation. It's going to cost you your will and your way and the way that you want to live your life. And it will ultimately cost you your life. And here's why this is good news, though, is because we think we know what's best for our life. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you, God's best for your life is so much better Mm -hmm. than what you believe your best for your life is. And I've experienced this in my life, in my walk with Jesus, what it looks like to have to lay down everything what it what it looks like for following Jesus to actually cost you everything and and I'll do this much but for just a second I, I just want to talk to just the men in the room the men watching online because I know that we were raised as men to have this cultural understanding of what being a man is that we're tough that we put on the the strong face for everybody, that we have to be this pillar, that we're going to earn money and we're going to, you know, be there for our family and we're going to be providers. And so much of that is good, but then so much of it is toxic. And I believe that we could all agree with that. And what I've learned in my journey of following Jesus for the last 15 years is that so much of what I thought being a man was is actually the opposite of things that I thought growing up. Because every man wants to feel important and every man wants to be relied on and every man wants to be a leader. Right, guys? Like, we all feel that. And God has created you to be a leader. But what happens when you start to follow Jesus is that you realize that being a leader really means being a servant. Mm -hmm. And for the husbands in the room, we think that being a husband means being the head of our household. And so it means that I'm the one that's in charge. Do you know what it means? It means you're the first one to serve. Mm -hmm. It means that you help around the house. It means that you do the dishes and you take out the trash and you help with laundry and you give kids baths and you tuck tuck them in at night. 
It means that you're a servant because Jesus was a servant. Mm -hmm. And we're following Jesus. And it's not fun to get around your buddies and go, yeah, man, I, like, I do the dishes at my house. It's like, no, nah, man, I kick back and my wife does everything because I'm the man and I'm the provider. Okay. That's not what following Jesus looks like. That's not what being a leader looks like. Do you know what leaders do? Leaders go first. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, you have to be a servant. As a father, if you're a father in this room, a father watching online, you're not just a father because you're trying to raise productive members of society. Yes, that's part of it. Do you know what your kids need to hear? They need to hear you say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They need to hear you say, I was wrong. They need to see the way that you love their mom. They need to see the way that you love people. They need to see the way that you serve. And do you know what all of this means? It means it's going to cost you your pride. Yeah. And it's going to cost you your comfort because it's uncomfortable to get down on your knee and look your five-year-old in the face and say, Daddy was wrong for yelling at you. And it's going to cost you your position and your status and, and what you think your identity is. Because my identity is wrapped up in, in me looking a certain way and presenting myself a certain way. It's like, no, my identity is a follower of Jesus. It's going to cost you your reputation because there will be people in this world who turn their nose up at you and say, that's not being a man. I would beg to differ. I believe it's the best version of being a man. Mm. And then it will cost you your will and what you believe you want to do with your life. And trust me, if I did what I wanted to do with my life, I would not be standing here right now. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's going to cost you your life. But can I tell you that God's version of what he wants for your life will always be better, of your version, better than your version of what you want for your life? Mm -hmm. Following Jesus will cost you everything, but I promise you it's worth it. Yeah. Pastor Scott's so right. I, I frequently go through this list, and I find myself having to lay down my pride and my comfort because I have expectations, things yeah. I thought would be 15 years ago, I don't think I could have ever thought my life would look like this. And that's not for the bad, it's for the better. Right. Because my life looks better than I could have ever prayed or hoped or imagined. And parenting looks completely different than I ever thought that it was going to. Yeah. But it is better than I could have ever imagined. That's right. And planning a church is harder and scarier and more stressful and more painful than I could have ever thought that it would be. Amen. <laughs> but the community of believers and family that God has brought here at That's Keys right. Church is better than I could Come have on. ever imagined. That's right. And so it is true that following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus will cost you, but I know personally that it will make your life better. Because following Jesus will make your life better. And this is why discipleship is a paradox. <laughs> because, yes, following Jesus will cost you everything. But it's also true that following Jesus will make your life better. Mm -hmm. And not your version of better. Right. Because we think better is more stuff and more resources and more free time and more vacations and a bigger house and a bigger car. And God may bless you in those ways. And you may be able to experience some of those things, but those aren't the goal. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way in which Jesus makes your life better. This is what better looks like. It looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about these as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And if you've come to Keys Church for any amount of time, you hear me mention these in some way, shape, or form almost every Sunday. Because when we give people an opportunity to step from dark to light, from death to life, to put their faith in Jesus, we say that Jesus didn't just die so you could have heaven one day. Praise God that we do have eternal life, but he died so that you can have abundant life today. And we're not talking about more possessions and more stuff. We're talking about things that the world could never give you. Love, real love. Mm -hmm. Joy, real joy, not cheap happiness. Actual joy, peace. The world cannot give you peace. Only Jesus can give you peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I don't know a person in this room who would look at any of these and say, I don't want that. We all want every single one of these. 
Everyone wants to be known as somebody who's joyful and full of love and as a person who they can go to because they're a pillar of peace and they're patient and they're kind and they're just a good person. They're faithful. They're gentle. They practice self-control. These are all things that we want. When Paul talks about these things, he says, hey, against these such things, there is no law. Mm -hmm. This is good stuff. This is stuff we all want. And this is how following Jesus will make your life better. Right. When I'm praying for the better that God has for me, so specifically when I'm praying for the fruits of the Spirit, um, I will tell you just now, God steps in and He gives me the opportunity to do it. And yeah. so if this is something that you're praying for, know that there's going to be opportunity that arises for you to use patience. Yeah. And so when I'm on the phone with someone, maybe even someone here from church, and I'm talking with them and I'm encouraging them or I'm praying f with them, mm -hmm. I've also got kids all around me and I've got a kid who needs something. And I have another kid who has combined all eight puzzles and all the pieces together. And I got another kid who's crying because now there's 800 puzzle pieces all mixed together and we don't know which one's the solar system. And then another one who wants to paint while I need to make lunch. And then, Lord forbid, Scott um, texts me and needs something during that time period. And I am not always kind or gentle or... You're always kind of gentle. Yeah. Like this may or may not be a real life situation <laughs> from this week. <laughs> but when I pray for those things, I know that this situation is going to be hard. That refinement process, it is going to be hard. That yeah. giving everything, the costing everything is going to be hard. That's right but it will be better through Jesus. And so I have to choose and I have to make that choice even when every ounce of self-regulation has left my body, I have to choose self-control. Right. I have to choose to do those things. And so today, as we continue on, I wanna look at an instance in the Bible in which Jesus really expounds on and he talks about that choice, yeah. the hard choice here that we have to make. And so today we're gonna to be in the book of Matthew. It is another gospel. We're gonna be in chapter 19. And this is a story that you may be familiar with and we tend to call it the story of the rich young ruler. And so I'm going to quickly summarize because there are a lot of verses here. But before we jump in, I'm going to summarize and get us up until that point. And so um, what happens here is that a young, wealthy man comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, what must I do to receive eternal life? And he and Jesus have a few exchanges. And the young man is just kind of like, hey, check mark on that one. Oh. Yeah, no murders, check, done it. No stealing, Absolutely. Hey, I'm loving my neighbor. Check mark on that one. And so Jesus looks at him and says, okay, and so now I'm asking you to sell all your possessions and to follow me. And so Jesus gives him a direct command here. And the young man walks away sorrowful. And the disciples, they hear this exchange, and so they follow up with Jesus, and they ask Jesus about this. And Jesus says, hey, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter heaven. And so the disciples are shocked by this. They say, well, yeah. hey, Jesus, well, who could be saved? And Jesus says, well, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's right. And the point of the story here is not to say, hey, if you're rich, you can't go to heaven. That's, that's not what we're yeah. saying here. But what Jesus is saying is that this young man, while he maybe was interested and intrigued by Jesus, mm. that he needed to lay this down, that right. this was going to be the thing that was going to cost him. And there was a portion that he was holding back here. And so his interest in Jesus, however much he maybe believed or cared about the ministry that Jesus had, it didn't outweigh the attachment that he had to his earthly wealth. Mm. And so we've kind of set the scene here, and we're going to catch up in verse 27. And so Peter, who was one of the disciples, answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And this is Jesus, and Jesus responds and says, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel." And then in verse 29, it says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. That's right. Jesus is telling the disciples not to trust in their present circumstances and not to put their hope in the things of this world. Because even though discipleship and following Jesus would cost them. And trust me, it did cost them. It cost mm -hmm. them their lives. Yeah. That 
following Jesus would also bring them an eternal hope. It would bring them eternal life. Yeah, that's right. And in these two passages that are very similar, where Jesus is drawing this line in the sand of what discipleship is and what being a disciple looks like, I I believe we see what it actually looks like to be a disciple. I think Jesus makes it clear for us. It really is cut and dry. It really is black and white. And I, and I think the first thing that we see is this, that disciples deny themselves. Mm-hmm. This is what disciples do. Jesus says to die to ourselves, to pick up our cross, and then to follow him. And this is what we have to do. It's no longer about us and our will and our way and what we wanted for our life and our dreams and our hopes. That's no longer what it's about. It's about following Jesus. And it's about his will. And it's about his way. And it's about what he wants for our life. And we get so confused and we can get so off track because the world says, follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Follow your dreams. Do whatever makes you feel good. Do whatever makes you happy. But Jesus says something distinctly different. Jesus says, follow me. Mm -hmm. Don't follow the world. Don't follow your will and your way and your desires. No, follow me. And so we see the second thing that disciples do is that disciples follow Jesus. Right, and this is a non-negotiable. Disciples follow Jesus. They follow after Jesus. And if you have um, been apart for the past two weeks and you have heard the past two messages that Pastor Scott has taught, he's done a great job. He's taught about sin and he's taught um, more about um, being able to um, see that through and to see how to follow Jesus in that sense. And so what I would say is if you haven't seen those messages, I would encourage you to go back and listen to sin and repentance Mm -hmm. on these series. But what you need to know is that if you want to follow after Jesus, you're going to have to admit that you need to have a need for Jesus, that you have a need for a savior. And I'm just going to take some cues when it comes to following after Jesus from the disciples in the Bible, in the New Testament, who followed after Jesus. And what they did is they spent time with Jesus. They spent time in prayer and they spent time worshiping and they spent time in a fellowship of believers. They spent time fellowshipping with other believers, being with other believers. And so that's what I would encourage us to do here is to be in a body of believers and to pray and to worship together. And these are all the makings and the markings of disciples is that disciples deny themselves and that disciples follow Jesus, but it doesn't stop there. Disciples make disciples. Yeah. And you may be thinking, where did Jesus say that? Because <laughs> I didn't hear that in either of the passages that we just read. Well, good news, Jesus says it. We just hadn't read it yet. <laughs> this is also a non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. And some of you are very familiar with the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, them being the disciples, this is before he ascends to heaven. So this is after he's defeated sin, death, and the grave. He died on the cross. He rose to life on the third day. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. He's with his disciples. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Mm -hmm. Therefore, go. Not therefore, call yourself Jesus followers and live your life however you see fit. No, therefore, go and do what? Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. And I love that Jesus says, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age because we hear this and so many Christians are like, wasn't that one just for the disciples he was talking to? (laughs) Like, do I actually have to share my faith? Do I actually have to try to make disciples? The answer, yes. If you're a disciple, practicing discipleship, Mm -hmm. if you're a follower of Jesus, and we think that this is big and scary, and we think that we just have to, like, walk up to a stranger and be like, can I tell you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? You know, like, this is how we think about this. But there's this principle that Kirsten and I try our best to live by. And we took this from a pastor by the name of Pastor Andy Stanley years ago. And he has this saying, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Mm -hmm. You can't disciple everyone. It's impossible. 
I can't disciple everyone, and I'm a pastor. Even at a church our size, I could not possibly disciple every person in our church one-on-one. I couldn't disciple every man. Pastor Kirsten couldn't disciple every woman. And so what do you do? You do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. You make disciples, and then that disciple invests in somebody else and makes another disciple. Mm -hmm. And it's this trickle-down effect because this is what disciples do. This is what Jesus' followers do. They make disciples. Yes, they deny themselves. Yes, they follow Jesus. But also, yes, they make disciples. All three. Not just two of the three. All three are non-negotiables. And why is this so important? Well, it gets us out of our comfort zone. It stretches us. forces us to take next steps. It forces us to participate in discipleship. And discipleship is how we become who God created us to be. Mm -hmm. And we say this often here, but you do not become on accident. That's right. Becoming is a very intentional, a very active act, just like discipleship is an active Mm -hmm. act. And so we become who it is that God has created us to be by becoming more like Jesus, by looking more like Jesus, just like a student learns from their teacher, a disciple follows after Jesus and becomes more like Jesus, looks more Mm -hmm. like Jesus. And why do we do that? Because yes, again, discipleship can be hard and denying yourself can be hard and it is going to cost you something and it's not easy, but we do ultimately believe that Jesus will make your life better. That's right. It may not be the way that you envisioned it, maybe the way that you had planned it out, but we do believe that there is a better and that Jesus knows that better and he will make your life better. And this is not just for us. Becoming more like Jesus, becoming who it is that God has created you to be and reflecting Jesus to a hurting and a dying world around us is how we reach people with the hope of Jesus. Because discipleship is how Osceola begins to look like heaven. Some of you in this room know this, and if you don't, those of you in the room, you can look to the back over there. That sign says, until Osceola looks like heaven. Mm Mm-hmm. If you want to know what the vision of this church is, it's right back there on that sign. It says, become who God created you to be. Our goal is to see people set free from sin to become who God created them to be. What people? Every person in Osceola County. Mm -hmm. And so why do we do what we do? When will Keys Church be big enough? When will we stop meeting on Sundays? How long is this going to last? Um, Until Osceola looks like heaven. Right. Until every person has heard the good news of Jesus. Until every person's life has been transformed and they've stepped from dark to light, from death to life. And that happens through discipleship. Mm -hmm. This is why discipleship is so important. This is why it's a non-negotiable. This is why as disciples we have to make disciples because 63% of our community doesn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's people all around us every single day who are separated from a God who loves them. And we have the good news. How dare us keep it to ourselves? We're in this until Osceola looks like heaven. And discipleship is the way. Mm -hmm. Discipleship is how we begin to see that happen. And we know discipleship is hard. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It can feel messy. It can feel like this impossible feet. It can feel like, man, it's, it seems so difficult. But remember, discipleship and following Jesus, it's a paradox. Because following Jesus, yes, it will cost you everything, but it will give you everything at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because while it may feel like it costs you your will and your way and your life, it ultimately gives you eternal life. And it is because of Jesus and His finished work on the cross, that we can have eternal life. It is because Jesus came and lived the life that we couldn't, and He died a death that we deserve, and He rose to life on the third day. He defeated sin, death, and the grave. And now we can be children of God. And we can have eternal life one day, but we can have abundant life today, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. We can experience those things because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't look at following Jesus as impossible. And we shouldn't look at discipleship as this burden that's simply going to cost us everything. We should look at it as the way to get everything. Mm 
-hmm. Everything that we need. Everything that God wants for us in our lives. Discipleship is a non-negotiable. Following Jesus is a non-negotiable for those of us who call ourselves Christians. And maybe you're here today and you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're watching online. And you've never truly participated in discipleship, but you want to take that step. And you want to step from dark to light. You want to step from death to life. And you want to give your life to Jesus, to follow him, to be a fully devoted follower, to look more like Jesus, to become a disciple. I want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. Will you pray with me? Father God, Lord, you are so good. We're so thankful to to be here in this place today, God, to be able to worship you right now, Lord. I I just want to pray for anybody who's in this room, anybody who's watching online, maybe listening later, who's within the sound of my voice, and they say, hey, that's me. I am ready to step into a relationship with Jesus, to make him my Lord and my Savior. Maybe there's somebody here today who realizes that they've just been calling themselves a follower of Jesus, but they haven't actually been following him. They haven't actually been practicing discipleship. Either way, today's the day. Stepping into a relationship for the first time, maybe returning. Right where you are, I want to give you the opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. But just know that it's not a prayer that saves you. It's the posture and the position of your heart. But if you're ready to take that step right now, you can just pray something like this to yourself. Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I accept your free gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus lived the life I couldn't, that he died a death that I deserve on the cross, but that he rose to life on the third day, that he defeated sin, death, and the grave. And because of him, one day I can be in heaven with you. God, help me to follow you to the best of my ability for the remainder of my life in Jesus' name. God, for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would actively participate in discipleship, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that we wouldn't be intimidated or look at it as something that just simply cost us everything and is such a burden, but we would realize that it actually gives us everything, that it's actually the way to abundant life, that it's actually the way to becoming who God created us to be. It's the way to a fulfilled life. It's a way to looking more like Jesus. God, help us to do that this week. Take steps to love, to serve, to look more like Jesus. God, I thank you for every person in this room, every person within the sound of my voice. I pray that you would be with them this week, that you would bless them, that you would go before them and behind them, give them favor with you and everyone who they see and talk to. Lord, we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.